Hello and welcome. I am Vivian Bass, an executive committee member of RespectAbility's Board of Directors and co-chair of RespectAbility's Global Jewish Inclusion Work. We are truly thrilled to have participants today representing lots and lots of different time zones and lots of different countries, including the United States, Canada, United Kingdom, Israel, Germany, and Argentina. Thank you all for making it a priority to join us. I sincerely hope today finds you and those you hold dear safe and healthy. I am pleased and proud to serve as moderator for today's informative session, how to recruit, accommodate, and promote Jewish leaders with disabilities. Joining me are panelists Lori Golden, Ernst and Young's LLP's Ability Strategy Leader. She's having we some technical difficulties, so we'll look for her jo joining us later. And Lee Chernotsky, founder and CEO, that's Chief Encouragement Officer of Rosie's Foundation. The webinar is fully accessible with American Sign Language Interpreter, live captioning, and screen reader. Please keep in ongoing contact with us via the chat and the Q&A functions as we eagerly anticipate our brief yet robust dialogue following the two panelists' presentations. Oh, uh, more than 50% of respectability staff and over 50% of our boards of directors are persons with disabilities, both visible and non-visible. With integrity and validation, all play a pivotal role via their respective positions in a most respectful and mutually beneficial manner. Now in our seventh year, respectability continues to be stalwart, prominently in the forefront of our nation and beyond, as our disabilities leaders and activists strive to fight stigmas and advance opportunities for persons with disabilities. We are especially proud that our Jewish inclusion work encompasses an actively engaged network of several thousand organizations, individuals, businesses, and other entities globally. Enormous gratitude is expressed for the most extraordinary generosity of the following foundations, including the Jewish Community Foundation of Los Angeles through the Cutting Edge Grant, the Diane and Guilford Glazer Philanthropies, the Charles and Lynn Schusterman Family Foundation, and several others that have made this nationally unprecedented series of seven innovative webinars possible. They all have shared not only their treasuries, yet additionally their hearts and their deep passion for our work. Although respectability is the lead host for this acclaimed webinar series, we are extremely honored that nearly 45 additional stellar local, national, and international organizations are proudly joining us as series co-promoters. Today's webinar is the third of seven sessions with these four upcoming webinars to follow. Each Tuesday, together, we are addressing yet another critical component of Jewish inclusion. Please make every effort to join us for as many of these marvelous upcoming webinars as is possible. Per the United States set, Census, one in five persons in America has a physical, sensory, cognitive, mental health, or other disability. Respectability recently conducted a comprehensive landmark study of over 4,000 Jewish participants, which revealed that although the topic of inclusion was of paramount importance, less than one third of organizations and businesses are in actuality practicing this vital concept. The will was there, yet as was consistently evident from the responses, not the knowledge, not the know-hows, not the how-tos. We are therefore responding to this gap and are addressing this unmet need via our comprehensive series. Jewish individuals with disabilities are making remarkable contributions, strengthening their organizations, and ultimately the fabric of the Jewish and greater community. Amongst dozens of examples are actress and Academy Award winner, 
Marley Mathlin, active with numerous federations and other Jewish entities, was recently honored by Jewish Women International, JWI, as a woman to watch and was featured on the cover of JWI's globally circulated magazine. Erin Kaufman, a speaker for the first session of this series, serves as a senior legislative associate for Jewish Federations of North America, and additionally as a board member of the Union for Reform Judaism, URJ, and as an executive committee member of Jewish Foundation for Group Homes. Matat Koch, Esquire, up front, the blue, is the Director of Respectabilities, California Leadership and Jewish Engagement, and additionally serves as our legal counsel. Matan, a Senate confirmed appointee of President Obama to the National Council on Disability, has also advised dozens of Jewish organizations, including Hillel and URJ. Joshua Steinberg, a new member of the staff team, having learning disabilities, is the program associate with California Learning Leadership and Jewish Engagement. Matan and Josh have done an outstanding job coordinating the vast myriad of moving parts on behalf of this unprecedented series. It is a privilege to participate in this training session along with Lori Golden and Lee Chernovsky. In addition to my roles of respectability, I am the immediate past board chair of Jewish Women International, JWI, and the CEO Emeritus of Jewish Foundation for Group Homes, a board member of Save a Child's Heart US, and Caring Matters, and JCPA. I first met Lori Golden of New York City when she participated in a respectability panel on empowering Jewish women with disabilities. Lori is Ernst & Young's LLP's Ability Strategy Leader, advising the firm on meetings, trainings, and technology educating corporate employees and others on abilities issues and creating new recruiting and employment models. Having a non-visible disability, Lori serves on the U.S. Department of Labor Circle of Champions, the Disabilities in Global uh, Roundtable, and is Vice Chair of the Board of Transcend. With the firm for 22 years, Lori is a winner of Ernst & Young's Chairman's Values Award and a two-time winner of the firm's Better Begins With You Award. Her guiding principles and pearls of wisdom from the corporate world can readily be incorporated into best practices for our Jewish organizations. So Lori, joining us by phone. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, and uh, uh, a huge thanks to the respectability team for their endless patience uh, with the technology hassles that ended me uh, up on the phone today. But given that I haven't had a haircut in four months, um, we're doing you all a favor. <laughs> it's a privilege to, to be with you. I'm not sure about pearls of wisdom, but I'll do my best um, to share uh, what I can that uh, – really might apply to your organizations of whatever size um, and, and scope they might be. Um, I am on the first slide, uh, Josh. Um, and before I uh, start, uh, I just wanted to share some context. Um, EY has, I, I think, the fairly unique distinction in the corporate world of being um, one of the first very large global organizations that was actually founded not only by somebody who had two significant disabilities, but because of those disabilities. Um, today, uh, EY, the global organization that Ernst & Young LLP is part of, has almost 300,000 people uh, working around the world. We specialize in uh, tax advice and uh, assurance work and uh, doing management consulting and other kinds of financial advisory work. We have about 50,000 people in the U.S. But we were founded um, in the 1880s um, by a Scottish immigrant who was trained as a lawyer uh, in Scotland and lost his hearing um, in law school and already had vision in only one eye due to a cricket accident. And because of his disabilities, he was not able to, to practice um, 
courtroom law. So like many immigrants, he came to the new world looking for new opportunities, hung out a shingle, um, and because he had few other choices, um, used his uh, considerable talents and ingenuity and creativity and just natural entrepreneurship to found a firm uh, that began as our Arthur Young um, and is now Ernst & Young um, LLP in the Americas and EY globally. So we owe our founding uh, to the entrepreneurship and the creativity uh, and the gutsiness of somebody who was deaf and had low vision, was an immigrant, and really needed to do things differently. And we've been working hard to live up to that legacy ever since. I'm going to talk to you today uh, about just kind of two pieces of the puzzle. Um, that is recruiting um, and uh, supporting. So um, including and supporting, and I'm on my second slide, Josh, thank you, um, including and supporting employees with disabilities. Um, and we do this by focusing on three key areas. One is working to ensure that our recruiting reaches um, all qualified candidates with disabilities we can and that our recruiting processes work for qualified candidates with disabilities. The second is to pay attention to signaling our inclusiveness and our commitment to uh, creating an inclusive and accessible workplace for people with disabilities in everything we do, not just in our recruiting processes, but in how we run our business day to day. And I'll talk about that in a little bit. And thirdly, um, by making a commitment to providing the tools, the physical environment, the technology, and the kinds of supports, and I don't just mean accommodations, although that's part of it, that uh, people working with disabilities might need to be successful and to thrive in your organization. So I'm on uh, page 15, the third, my third slide, Josh. Thank you. Um, you'll see here um, a picture, and I think this is a good illustration, which is one of the reasons I'm pointing it out, uh, of a few EY people. You see sort of my hands at the far right frame, and I do, um, Vivian, correction, not have one non-visible disability, but I have a plethora of non-visible disabilities. I think when I joined the firm, I may have two, and uh, it goes on and on these days. But um, we have uh, two individuals um, in, in the photo who are uh, power wheelchair users. Um, one is quadriplegic, one is paraplegic, um, another individual with non-visible disabilities, and, and myself. And the, I point this out both because it is inclusive and accessible to point out any images you, you have in your presentations, and that's a, a good practice to follow, but also um, because the idea of having images of people with visible disabilities is one very easy way you can signal your organization's commitment to inclusiveness. This is a photo we took ourselves of our own people. Um, obviously, we're a large organization, and we have photographers um, who can do this, but uh, and I know that there are further sessions on this a little bit later in the series. There are now terrific photo libraries of really good quality um, professional uh, photos in all kinds of work settings that show people with disabilities. And we know that, uh, as Vivian cited, one in five people um, have disabilities although the majority of those, about 70%, it's believed, are non-visible, we all have people with disabilities 
um, working in our workplaces. So it's only realistic to show that in our materials, in our presentations, on our websites. So one thing you can do is make sure you include those images. The second thing you can do, and there's absolutely no cost um, to, to this either, is just to take time to use terms like disabilities, all abilities. Um, uh, we use the term um, a diverse array of abilities, not as a euphemism for disabilities, but to point out the fact that we all have array, an array of abilities and disabilities. Um, it costs nothing um, to use images from some of these free photo libraries or to include mentions. Um, if you have employees with disabilities working with you or on your board or in your leadership, you want to make sure that you share success stories or at the very least um, include some role models to give people sense that folks with disabilities work with your organization. And then finally, you want to leverage any connections you have um, not only in the community and uh, your all community organizations. So uh, just, yeah, just like respectability um, is part of a network with, with all of you, um, you're all in multiple networks with lots of connections and you want to leverage those connections, um, your uh, folks own volunteer activities and involvements and tie in the idea of hiring people with a range, uh, range of abilities into the strategy of your organization, into your values, into your mission, um, however you can. And I've no doubt that there are lots and lots of obvious tie-ins here. Um, we're on the next page, uh, Josh, labeled uh, page 14. In terms of recruiting, you want to cast a very, very broad net, but you also want to make sure that you're getting uh, candidates with disabilities as part of those efforts by being strategic in your targeting. So the first thing you want to do is take a look at your processes, um, where you source from, how you interview, who does those interviews, um, and um, what that whole recruitment process looks like, what your job postings say um, at your site, um, the baseline site for your organization, and any materials that you have. Uh, and you want to make sure that they are inclusive, inclusive in terms of the language, uh, inclusive in terms of the images and the references that you're using, but also that they're accessible, meaning that uh, people with disabilities will be able to access that information. And digital accessibility um, for information that's presented online um, means um, making sure that you have uh, text that's big enough so it can be seen that if you have images um, that they are captioned or you use something called alt text. I'm not going to go into any of those mechanics because um, you'll have it very well covered um, in uh, a future webinar. Um, but you'll want to inventory everything you do for both inclusiveness and accessibility. Um, and again, the, this series can, can help you with that. You'll also want to train um, your recruiters and your hiring managers, whoever um, might be interfacing with candidates. And that includes coworkers uh, on etiquette, on respectful language to use, on the basics of the Americans with Disabilities Act, um, and on what kinds of resources um, and supports are available to assist people uh, with disabilities in your organization, whether that's knowledge of the accommodation process. They should just know that, whether they're going to discuss it or not. They should know what the accommodation process is. Um, if you offer 
um, peer mentoring or coaching, or if you have employee resource groups, if you're a large enough organization to support that, just what's available um, so that people can intelligently speak about it uh, if asked. You also want to canvas disability-specific recruiting sources, and happily there are many that are free and available to, to everyone. There are disability-specific job sites. One that's free is run by EARN, E-A-R-N, um, that is uh, a site for uh, employers and employees um, to support hiring people with disabilities, and it's funded by the U.S. Department of Labor, so it's free to all of us. Um, there are career fairs, both live and now many virtual career fairs going on specific uh, to folks with disabilities, and as many of you know, there are a host of really great community organizations from vocational rehabilitation organizations um, to community agencies uh, like Transen, uh, which uh, was mentioned earlier, Vivian mentioned I'm on the board of. Um, there are um, all kinds of disability-specific recruiting firms. Those are not free, um, but it's something to, to look into if you have budget for it. Um, and there are disabilities organizations like Respectability, uh, Disability in, the National Organization on Disability, um, the National Business and Disability Council, many of whom can put you in touch um, with both great candidates and sources for candidates. And of course, you can go to universities. All universities have career centers, but they also have um, disability services centers where students with disabilities who need accommodations go to get their accommodations plans in place. So these um, centers know who the students with disabilities on campus are. And if uh, recent uh, graduates would be of interest to you and you have universities, large universities nearby, you could make connections with their disability services centers and put them on the lookout for just the kinds of candidates that you might be interested in hiring. Um, there are also apprenticeships and internship programs run by many of the organizations I mentioned specifically for young people, um, high school, um, college age, um, and young adult with disabilities and all kinds of training programs. Um, so there is a lot out there, much of it free and very, very easy to access. And my advice is to try a number of these sources, see what seems to work with you, um, see which organizations you work easily with, um, and then really invest in developing a few targeted relationships that you return to over and over again um, each time you're recruiting. Rather than throw the kitchen sink at it, uh, try the kitchen sink, so to speak, uh, and then see which faucet works best for you and return to that one uh, time and again. And the final thing I'll mention is really what um, enables people with disabilities um, to not only be successful, um, but to grow in your organization and to develop professionally. And if you're like EY, and I, I hope you are, you don't just want to hire people to do a job. You want to hire people to do a job brilliantly and then to be able to grow. And whether they technically advance within your organization, or they're just growing in their skills, their, their visibility, um, and uh, their later uh, career choices, um, you want to provide that opportunity. And in order to do that, um, you want to make sure that your technology um, and your facilities, meaning 
you know, your, your offices, your physical environment are accessible, that people with disabilities can get around um, pretty easily and comfortably, uh, and then they can use your, uh, your sites, uh, your tools, your information, um, anything that's technically enabled. Um, you also want to make sure that you have some kind of accommodation process. It doesn't have to be fancy. Um, obviously, the law requires that you accommodate um, people with disabilities, but as I think Lee's going to talk about later, it needn't be a big deal and it needn't be expensive. And in fact, most of the cases, uh, accommodations are, are uh, changes in scheduling that, that cost absolutely nothing. Um, so create an accommodation process and then make sure that you have that documented in writing um, and communicate that to all your people, not just people who you think might need it, because you never know who might acquire a disability or who has a non-visible disability and might need an accommodation that you not, might not be aware of. Um, you want to look at what you have available to support your people in a personal way. Um, if you are a big enough organization, you might have what are called employee resource groups. Those are groups of uh, employees um, who have something in common in, in terms of background um, or ethnicity. Uh, sometimes there are religious <laughs> resource groups. Um, so often there are disabilities resource groups um, that get together, but it's very easy um, to just arrange for peer mentoring, um, to uh, have individuals who really know your organization and are really committed um, just take on any new hire. But this is especially helpful for people with disabilities um, to help them get comfortable and kind of learn the rules of the road a little bit. Um, if you have development programs, um, to build skills uh, and to help people develop relationships um, within and outside your organization. Um, those are really, really helpful as well. Um, so you want to kind of canvas and see what you have to help people succeed and make sure uh, that you make those opportunities available to your employees with disabilities. Um, and that you educate those who are involved in delivering those services or doing the mentoring or doing the coaching um, in the basics of disabilities etiquette and language and so forth um, so that everybody feels comfortable. Um, the last two points I'll mention is you don't want to just train a few people. This isn't about just supervisors. Uh, and it's not just about recruiters. It's about making sure that you really have an inclusive environment. And the only way that you have an inclusive environment is if everybody knows and is fairly comfortable with the basics. And by basics, I mean things like what words to use. We all know today that in the U.S., um, we don't use the term handicapped. That's not considered respectful. Um, we also know uh, in this country, although that's not true in all parts of the world, we don't use the word retarded. Um, we've evolved. But there are some subtleties in terms of language as well as kind of do's and don'ts of etiquette that may be less obvious. And you want to educate people on that. Happily, there are lots and lots of free resources, some of them um, are our own at EY that we make available publicly because we've taken the time and trouble to develop them for our own people. Um, so we make them available to, to anybody, anybody who want, might want to take advantage. Um, and then you do want to dip in and make sure that you've especially trained um, any supervisors uh, on non-visible disabilities. Uh, as, as we said, one out of five Americans has a disability. 70, 70 percent of those are non-visible. And that's something that people don't think about. 
they don't realize, and they don't realize the plethora of disabilities that are included in that. And just making people aware of that really changes their frame of reference. Um, you also want to make sure that supervisors know what your accommodations policy is and what your process is and the part that they may or may not um, play in that process. And the final thing I'll mention is a fine point, but it's really, really important. It is important for all your people to get frequent and really frank open feedback in order to know, to know where they're doing well and where they're not. Um, we all know we, we, we need that in order to continually improve. And, you know, those of us who are really want to grow um, are very anxious for that feedback. Well, if people are known to have disabilities, there's often uh, a tendency to, to want to be kind and to want to be protective um, and to feel uncomfortable giving um, what could be viewed as criticism or constructive feedback. So people with disabilities sometimes don't get um, the negative feedback that they need in order to know where they need to improve. And that doesn't do them any favors. What it does is put people with disabilities at a huge disadvantage because colleagues are getting open feedback, they're getting protected, and they may not be performing as well and may not get the opportunities to advance, develop, and grow. Um, and what starts out as a kindness winds up um, being really, really disadvantaging um, to people with disabilities. So Thanks, those Lori. are some of Lori, the Lori, key things I would stress. Okay. Yep. Lori, to be sensitive to the time, if we could yep. um, be able to uh, conclude so we could uh, move along to our next panelist. Sure. Okay. Thank you so much. Yep. Okay. This is terrific. Thank uh, you. Next, we are pleased to welcome uh, Lee Chernotsky, MBA of the Los Angeles area, who is the founder and the chief encouragement officer of Rosie's Foundation, a most remarkable and innovative entrepreneurial organization training and employing persons with disabilities. I met Lee, a lifelong leader in disability advocacy and education at a, a respectability event hosted in Los Angeles last year and months later he traveled to DC to join us for respectability's annual conference on the Hill. In addition to Lee's founding role with Rosie's, he serves on the board of Culver City Arts Business Improvement District and he sought to address audiences on topics of accessibility, mental health, and social enterprise. And respectability is truly grateful, Lee, for your serving on our Los Angeles Programs Advisory Council and for welcoming and graciously hosting our Los Angeles respectability staff as they transitioned into our new LA headquarters. Welcome, Lee. Thank you so much, Vivian, and thank you everyone at respectability and the greater community uh, of all the names that were listed and all the names that came before <clears throat> that have made today possible for us to come together and spend some time. Uh, I don't know about you, but uh, often when I meet somebody, the first question they ask me is, well, what do you do? And I decided to make a change in that and how I start my conversations. Because I ask this question, how do you spend your time? It's the same question we should be asking about the candidates that we're potentially hiring or recruiting as volunteers or really ourselves, especially now during these challenging times where it seems like the world has kind of taken one of those black lights to show us everything that humanity needs to deal with. The, really, the only thing that really matters is how we spend our time. And when you ask somebody that question, most people pause for a second. They really have to think about it. How do I spend my time? What's important to me? What's important to the person I'm with? What's important to the people I care about? And hopefully, 
you're able to get to why they spend their time that way if you are able. But how many times have we all been stuck in that moment when someone says to you, what are you up to these days? Or what are you doing when you finish school? It can be rough, and especially during these times of uncertainty, but really times of opportunity. These questions have often become even more daunting for all of us. So today, what I'd like to talk to you about is what we can do together. On the next slide, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about how I spend my time. I spend my time, hopefully not driving too fast in that bus, but that bus has the basis, is the foundation for how I chose to spend my time and harness my diverse array of abilities. I love that, Lori, thank you. It's, uh, we use diverse abilities within the same context and um, EY has, has been an inspiration and in, in the model of, of how it started and where it started. And it's why, it's, it's, it's the why, it's always the why. And that incredible woman on all the way to the left was my grandmother, my Bubba Rose. Uh, and I've spent most of my time really growing into, uh, I think my lips, uh, that's me as a child. Uh, but really what my grandmother taught me after her incredible story of survival was that I should spend my time giving and growing with my family, pictured all the way to the right. My incredible wife, Nahama, who's a partner in Launching Rosies, and our incredible children, who are our inspiration and are probably our greatest teachers. We'll get back to that a little bit later. I spend my time giving and growing with my family and the crew at Rosies, a platform I'm grateful to be able to continue growing because Jeffrey and Leanne Sobrato gave me time they gave me time to generate accessible opportunities for people with diverse abilities, like me, like you, and a lot of people we all know to engage each other and work together to figure it all out. And if we're doing it right, every day winds up being a new adventure. And when my grandmother, Bubba Rose, who survived the Holocaust because her parents fought as partisans, and never missed an opportunity to let us know not if, but when you give more than you take, there is a tomorrow. Because she truly knew what that meant. Which is why we are in the process of repurposing our bus to provide an accessible podcast production platform to share the stories, build the skills, and promote networks of people and opportunities that promote diverse abilities with purpose. And on the next slide, We're gonna talk a little bit about an incredible perspective. Do you as an individual, do you as an organization have a fixed mindset or a growth mindset? Are you stuck in the old ways of doing things? None of us should be. And I share this picture because of our incredible training partners at Microsoft and their growth mindset of continuing to strive to make things more accessible. And even with the stores closing, figuring out how to take it online. This is an incredible moment in time. And our dear friend, Josh, pictured in the front here with the black and white striped shirt, wound up being the most incredible teacher of this session. And when you have a growth mindset, when you ask, how can I take on a new challenge? How can I push the envelope? You get to work with incredible trainers from Microsoft, like our dear friend, Samantha, who stopped and said, wait, Josh, how do I make that more accessible? And then he taught her. A lesson that lasted with all of us and continues to sit with me to this day. And if we go to the next slide, we're gonna talk about three steps of how you at your organization or you as an individual can participate in promoting people and not just focusing on a person with a certain number of letters at the end of their name or a diagnosis that comes with what's going on. It's about how they spend their time. We want to, the idea is promoting people who engage with their abilities. They are, encourage themselves to take initiative while providing opportunities for others to learn with them. And when those opportunities don't exist, 
we design with the diverse abilities and resources we have all generated together. And on the next slide, we're gonna talk about how we engage. We take that lesson from that Josh taught us, one of the greatest teachers I've ever had, and someone whose, whose legacy will last a lifetime. A text from a traditional quote, a traditional Jewish text, much can we learn from our teachers. More can be learned from our colleagues, but most do we learn from our students. Pictured here, Josh is using his diverse set of abilities to teach Evan, pictured on the other side here, how to create the design using the design tools and graphic design tools for them to come up with solutions so that the characters that Josh had had in his head for a long time could get out because Evan took the time to listen and Josh took the time to share. What happens when we do that? We become solutionaries, not revolutionaries. Revolutionaries start fights. They're not aware of how what they're saying might land on somebody else, how to regulate their emotions when things get tough, when someone tries to give you feedback. But if you have that skill set and not just the emotional intelligence, it's an awareness and a respect for the people you're spending time with. These are our opportunities now as we are redesigning how we all spend our time, how we work, what a workplace looks like, to design with the solutionaries of the future. On the next slide, I'd like to talk to you about how we can encourage that engagement. This is one of my favorite images and a beautiful story. Our dear friend, Tori, curating not just an art show with Maya, but the culture of how an art show can be moving forward. Because Tori, an accomplished artist herself and an incredibly generous philanthropist, and it's so beautiful to see the synergy with the Stanley and Joyce Black Family Foundation who has supported our work and, and here with respectability too, just seeing that as we were going through the slides just warmed my heart because it started with Tori volunteering with us Tori came to give an opportunity to that incredible artist, Maya, there so that they could both grow the perspective that they need with a network of diverse abilities, colleagues and allies that support both of their continued growth. And I'm proud to share that first art show in the Culver City Arts District, Maya's first gallery show, 85% of her work was sold that first night. There were no more of those red dots. When we encourage each other to grow a diverse, set of abilities. We then are able to, on the next slide, we'll talk about how we design the opportunities of the of future together. We regenerate what, what our story can be. The story has to be told by the people who are living it. The skills have to be given by those who have them so we can all grow. And real promotion, growing professionally, thus the emphasis on the capital P, the capital R, and the O, is that it's not just about the PR opportunity, it's about forward motion. Because it's that opportunity to pop, as we like to say at Rosie's, we put people together with the opportunities that are needed for a shared purpose so that everybody can grow. And I was really terrible at math and it was a, uh, and, and still have a challenge. And so for those that uh, might really appreciate this, this is a factorial, so it keeps going. And what I know from that is that factorial will keep going because that incredible group of people in that photo, uh, some of you might know Matan. I hope some of you here know Joey, and if not, you will. And my good friend, Jermel, who we are, as we look to grow more accessible opportunities together for everybody here in Los Angeles. On the next slide, we'll talk about designing opportunities with organizations to share those purposes. Here, a beautiful example of an opportunity that was created by our good dear friend and board member Courtney Mizell, who also supports the Sharsheret organization, bringing us the pop bus and the pop ice cream opportunities, a way to build a network to support their work for one of their key fundraisers. And from their one conversation, and a few months later, we are working with an incredible partner at the Caton Children's Museum. We're talking about the accessibility of that experience. 
So it's designed by the people who would be using it. I am so grateful for these opportunities. And as we transition to the next slide, I greatly, greatly appreciate all of you making the time to take a quick look at this video that was shot in March and a, a quick little background on this one. Our dear friends at Respectability called me and said, we, we need a place. This was, we just, it was a last minute opportunity and we all know when things change in the program space. And our doors are always open, not only to respectability, but to any partner of respectabilities as well in, in Los Angeles. We were just moving in, so there are still some boxes that you'll see. But this is an incredible opportunity to see a full, for lack of a better term, array of opportunity and ability in one room coming together to make it work. Obviously, that's less of a concern to a nonprofit organization, but the effectiveness is the same. Um, and so that's essentially what this slide says. And then it's not just. I, I was at a loss for words when that, in that moment. It doesn't happen very often. But I was at a loss for words in that moment when I looked and I saw the future, some of our future partners who, uh, well, Casey and everybody's looking good. But uh, as we transition uh, away from this slide, the, the last piece of this and, and, and what I wanted to mention was if you noticed in the beginning of the video, and Lauren Applebaum, hello, and Lauren, you are fantastic and it's always a pleasure to work with you. Lauren, what took it upon herself to make the entire opportunity as accessible as possible for everybody. There was a participant there who needed an interpreter. Unfortunately, the interpreter was not able to be there for an unforeseen circumstance, but the folks at Respectability made it, made it work. We all made it work. We all find our place together and doing that with our collective diverse abilities is the only way that will happen. By promoting those not only because of something, but because they are working together to grow. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, with our time, I think we just have time for maybe one quick question and then we will close our program. So Matan has been keeping uh, track for us. First, what I'm going to say is to those who put questions in the box about technical resources, there's a webinar in two weeks that is directly focused on that. And so we will go to those in great detail. Um, and one question I did want to pose for literally 30 seconds of answer. If there were two key takeaways for Jewish organizations, and we'll direct this at Lee first, who just spoke for all of this, what would those two key, key point takeaways be? To remember that your network is your net worth. The resources are always there. Like Lori had mentioned earlier, a lot of the accommodations that some might be worried about, they're not really a big deal. And if we all have some of those uncomfortable conversations together that are, might be case specific to an organization or to a role, just design with a concept of universal design of, of, of making whatever the opportunity is accessible in any way. Uh, that, that, that would be one. The other, uh, I would say, is uh, trust your gut. What, what feels right right now uh, is it, 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 it will go beyond that feeling if you continue to chase those results. And uh, so actually, I think this is a, a fantastic one because uh, I loved the, the connection of uh, going beyond simply a PR opportunity. But I think that recognizing that when you do chase results, eventually the resources will be there. When uh, you are not just looking at how can we just get through this today, but how can we set the table for everybody to be able to cook whatever they're doing and bring it all together. Uh, I always like that analogy of, of everybody bringing that together. So uh, I, I hope that sits well and happy to continue any conversation. Right, and I think we're gonna Thanks that the panelists might take questions by email at some point, send them to respectability. We'll send them along. We're really uh, running a little time because of our technical difficulties at the beginning. So I'm going to turn it back over to Vivian to bring us home. 
Right, so our dialogue will continue. So thank you so much. Uh, just want to mention Project Moses is our new Los Angeles based project, which is designed to prepare Jews with disabilities to engage with Jewish organizations as a contributor or as a leader, but not only as a participant. And later this year, we will be running a series of virtual trainings targeted to the Los Angeles community, but open to all Jewish adults with um, disabilities and having some college or equivalent experience. So to learn more, you'll visit the link on your screen on the bottom there. And our funds for Project Moses have generously been provided by the Jewish Community Foundation of Los Angeles and others. We want to also bring attention to two marvelous opportunities forthcoming in the immediate future. And the first is a virtual Shabbat dinner with Neil Jacobson and his wife, Denise, who are pioneers in the disability movement for decades and who actually appeared in the masterpiece documentary, Crip Camp, it's out there. And Neil is a most treasured member of Respectability's Board of Directors. Um, and additionally, make every effort to join us next Tuesday, July 14th at the same time for a most informative training session on how to ensure accessible events, both live and virtual across all platforms. So again, please stay engaged, keep in touch. Remember to complete the evaluation form you'll be receiving as your perspectives will be deeply valued. We thank our panelists, Lori and Lee, and our staff, Matan and Josh, and all the respectability team, especially our funders and our co-supporters. So stay safe and stay strong. And again, thank you for joining us today.